So um, hi, everyone, and good morning or good evening, you know, no matter where you're watching this from and what time you're watching this at. Um, today, we have an extremely exciting session. Uh, we're going to be in conversation uh, with ESA, and um, we're extremely excited about today's session because, you know, there's so many points about uh, the school's um, admissions policy, the assessment process, and about life in the school. School, um, you know, in a vibrant city. And, you know, we'd like to cover all these aspects today. Uh, with us, we have an extremely distinguished panel, and I'll introduce you, them to you. Um, and my name is Natasha Mankikar. I oversee client servicing at the Red Pens MBA service line. Um, and what I want to do today is I want to start today's session by just introducing the Red Pen to you and um, then introducing our panel to you. So without further ado, let's move on. The Red Pen is a comprehensive educational uh, counseling and admission service. Uh, we cover you know, a gamut of um, advisory services in the education space. We do everything from early advising, which is for high schoolers, um, to undergraduate admissions advice. We help students with postgraduate admissions advice, and we also help them with MBA um, application, um, you know, coaching and guidance. We've been in the education space for more than 10 years. We have admits to top universities, you know, across the globe, um, across the different service lines. And, you know, most importantly, we have an international team which helps clients out with their, um, you know, with their applications. We are a member of, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, global bodies. We have various affiliations, and this ensures that we are updated with the latest trends in. Uh, we understand what happens at various business schools, and we hold ourselves to the highest level of ethical standards. Let's talk about Team MBA. So the Team MBA is really a global team who um, looks at admissions, MBA admissions, um, you know, with a very holistic view. The individuals who are on the team are from a whole gamut of, um, you know, international college, from international business schools. And, um, you know, we have an extremely high uh, acceptance rate. Uh, we also have a very healthy uh, record of helping students with scholarships and, uh, you know, applying for scholarships. Um, and we're extremely proud of our track record. Very briefly, uh, the kind of um, MBA admissions we've had, we'd like to highlight that for the last two years, if you look at the, you know, what we're going to show you, you will realize that uh, we've helped uh, students with applications and admissions to, you know, like I said, business schools across the globe. And you will notice in both these years that ASA also features um, in the track record of the admissions that we have helped, uh, you know, students with. So um, let's talk about, um, you know, the panel we have today. And, um, you know, before we do that, I'll very briefly run you through uh, what you need to keep in mind um, if you're thinking about your admissions at this point in time. What we will tell you is that when you're applying to business schools, you need to keep these criteria in mind. These are six criteria and, you know, these need to be reflected in every element of your MBA application. At the very bottom, and perhaps the base of your application is always going to be demonstrated academic potential as displayed in your standardized test scores, your undergraduate GPA. Um, and it is an important aspect of the application that you're going to build. Next up is going to be your work experience um, and the quality of that work experience. So, you know, not only uh, should you consider the number of years of work experience that you have, but you also need to think about um, the kind of exposure that you've had, the companies that you've worked for, the complexity of work that you've done, and the upward trajectory you've seen in your career. Next up, you need to think about your goals. You need to think about what your short-term goals are and really what you want to do immediately after your MBA. And you also need to think about your long-term vision. It's as important to the schools for you to demonstrate that you have not only a goal for what when you when you finish with your program, but you also have a direction that you want to think in long term. And that long term could be anywhere in the, you know, in the window of like five to 10 years after you graduate from business school. After that, you need to really think about demonstrated leadership. 
at the heart of your application is um, you know, the kind of uh, case that you make or the pitch that you make in terms of how you think about impact, how you think about your role and how you think about your contribution, not only through the MBA program and the MBA community, but also what you want to do post your MBA as well. So you need to think about how you have demonstrated leadership in various um, you know, situations, whether it's personal, whether it's professional, up to the time that you have applied to business school. Extracurricular activities are as important and you need to think about, you know, who you are and how you're going to establish your identity and network and form connections on, um, you know, on campus as well as outside, not only all, but during your time at the program, but also after you finish your MBA program. And finally, and most, you know, importantly, you need to demonstrate a fit with the business school that you're applying to. And that is something that needs to happen organically. It is rooted in a lot of the research that you're going to do before you apply, but it also needs to come through in the pitch that you make to the business school that you're applying to. Um, and I think, uh, you know, Riddhi's nodding, so I know we're going to cover a lot of this in our session about the <laughs> ASA. So without uh, any delay, let's go on to um, introducing our panel. At this point, a lot of you will be, uh, you know, we're, we're putting this up in July, August, and, you know, a lot of you will be thinking about how you're going to create your final pitch for business school at this point in time. So, um, you know, I'm going to turn it over to you, Riddhi, uh, because I think we're going to cover that in detail now. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Natasha. And uh, I was most certainly nodding when you said cultural fit, uh, and especially with the essay. And, and, you know, we'll talk about that in a lot of detail, of course, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, Anand today, who's also here, you know, on the panel with us. Um, to give you a brief introduction about myself, I am the Associate Director of Admissions. I look after India and a couple of countries in South Asia as well. Uh, also an alumnus of the ESC MBA program myself. I graduated way back in 2017. Uh, I did come back and work in my family business for a couple of years before making a complete pivot to the education sector uh, in uh, early 2019. Uh, and I, in fact, started my education career stint with the Red Pen, uh, working as an education consultant, uh, learning the ropes of, you know, this industry and, and how it works. And of course, uh, you know, got a fantastic opportunity to come back to my alma mater. Uh, and, you know, most importantly, represent my home country, uh, you know, so I think it's been uh, an absolute joy, right? And I always say that ESA has played a dual role, you know, in my life so far, you know, one as when I was a former student. And now, of course, you know, as part of the admissions team, it is an institution that keeps giving to me, right? Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Anant, let's hear more about you. Thank you, Riddhi. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Anant, and I'm from the ESA MBA class of 22. So not so long ago, but still already uh, more than a year now. Uh, in terms of uh, my background, I have a background in financial services, so a former investment banker. Uh, I did about five years of investment banking before applying to ESA. Uh, I did my MBA from uh, 2020 to 2022, uh, so that's why I have class of 22. Uh, I changed my career from banking to consulting, and as we speak, I'm now based out of Munich in Germany and working with Allianz uh, in the management consulting business. Uh, in between, uh, so ESA is a two years program. Uh, so I also did a summer internship for that. I was working in London uh, at Citibank. That's my professional background. I'm very happy to be talking to you, Natasha, about ESA and sharing my experiences. Thank you. That's great. So, uh, Riti, I'm going to turn things over to you. Uh, we'd love to hear more about the program. So, you know, please do take us through it now. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, very, very happy to talk about, you know, what ESA can offer. And especially, I think today the aim is to bring perspective more on what ESA can do for you as an Indian student, or most importantly, as an international student uh, studying in Europe, right? Not only in terms of academic, but I think even in terms of the cultural uh, exposure that you'll have, you know, and of course, you know, the one thing that we all uh, are worried about is what's going to be my ROI, right? How am I going to take this to the next step, uh, step and stage when it comes to you know career progression so that's going to be the agenda for today i'm going to walk through this presentation um fairly quickly so that we can spend more time on q a later don't worry i'll bring back a couple of these slides during the q a so you will have access to some of these statistics later as well i've already given you my introduction so i'm going to move on from this slide faster 
Now, what is ESA all about? What kind of individuals do we look for? And most importantly, what are we offering you, you know, in terms of growth? I think that there are five pillars that what uh, that make ESA what it is. And number one is, of course, the entrepreneurial spirit, whether it's the case method, whether it's, you know, stakeholder management, teamwork, everything at ESA is back towards providing you that 360 vision, which no matter whether you're moving into a CXO role, you know, uh, within an operate within the industry, you're moving into consulting like Anand did, or probably, you know, you're going into an eye banking or a tech focused role. I think having perspective of what business has to offer and understanding the extreme elements, right? Right from strategy, leadership, ethics, marketing, operations, finance. This is what ESA teaches you and helps you develop at the end of the day. The second one, of course, being creating positive impact. I think this is something that we all very, very strongly believe that we want to culture, uh, cultivate and develop leaders who at the absolute core, believe in providing positive impact. Now, positive impact doesn't necessarily mean community, right? It can even be at a simple individual level, a team level. And I think this is important for you to know because when we think about cultural fit, right? Something that I got very excited about, this is exactly what we mean, right? We want to understand, are you an individual who's looking forward to making this positive impact? Because when you're at ESA on campus, trust me, you're going to be interacting with people constantly who bring their A game to the table. You're going to have to work with teams pretty much through the entirety of your two years. And if you're unable to, you know, be adaptable and humble and also want to make this positive impact, you're going to not fit in with what ESA has to offer. And I think the other two aspects, which is general management and a global mindset go hand in hand, right? General management, something that I've already covered, which is, you know, giving you the entire 360 of what business education has to offer. At the end of the day, we are a general management MBA program, and I'll cover how the entire academic curricula works in my future slide. When it comes to global mindset, um, I really like to highlight that, you know, we really own diversity. You know, when it's not just numbers that we're flashing to you that, you know, we have 50 plus nationalities and 85 percent diversity, uh, you know, in class, we own it to the level that even in the admissions team, you know, we have individuals who are representing different regions, right? For example, I'm responsible for India. I have a counterpart who's Japanese and responsible for Japan, South Korea. Similarly, I have someone in China, someone in South America, North America. So because we believe that our understanding of our individual markets and what we bring together to the team can really make a big difference. Now, imagine this with a class of 350 people, right? Imagine this with your learning team where, you know, you're constantly mingling with people from different academic, professional, cultural backgrounds. This is where your learning just grows 10 times. And I think, like I said, at the center of all of this is people. We really believe that humility, adaptability, and supporting one another is something that ESA really stands for and also helps you develop in your future career goals. Of course, the FT rankings have been uh, very, very generous for us uh, this year. And I think there are a lot of criteria that have gone into helping ESA get to number three globally. Uh, some of them that I've li listed on the screen here are, of course, you know, our focus on sustainability. Uh, like I said, diversity, you know, and diversity not only in terms of, you know, um, geographical or cultural diversity, it's most importantly even gender diversity, something that, uh, again, as part of the admissions team, I'm very, very proud of. And I think most importantly, it's also a lot about, uh, you know, the overall student satisfaction, right? And this stems from the ability of ESA to provide you opportunities, not only while you're on campus, but I think most importantly, in terms of how you develop and grow even post your MBA, right? And I think this would be a great question for Anant later that from he's had two years on campus and now one year off campus. And how has his experience been in terms of the, you know, resources that he had access to while he was on campus? And I think most importantly, how has the last one year been for him, right? Whether it's connecting with alumni, connecting with professors, uh, going back to campus, right? And, and learning about, okay, what is, what's new? How can I, you know, contribute to ESA a lot more? Now, this is what the overall two-year curricula would look like for you, right? As you see the first year, it's a little more rigid, but this is exactly why we want to provide you with the entire, uh, you know, like I said, 360 of business education. You know, you will have 24 core courses that you will go through, which of course cover, like I said, every aspect and vertical of business management, right? Now, come summer, this is actually where, or I would say one of the most important part for you as an international or an Indian student, because this is where you have access to, you know, a summer corporate internship. You can also use the summer to essentially work on an entrepreneurial idea, right? This is why 
realized that the entrepreneurial spirit aspect is something that is huge at DSA. If you are a budding entrepreneur or probably already have a small state startup, right? But you want to obviously scale that. You want to take that to the next step. Uh, so this is what you would do is spend your summer on campus with ESA, having, you know, exposure to peers, professors, network of, you know, angel investors that will actually be willing to invest in your idea. Every year we see, you know, several, several uh, current students actually get funding from, you know, ESA's own fund, which is called Finnaways. And of course, it's actually access to the angel network, uh, you know, group that you have. So even from an entrepreneurial experience, think of this as like your incubation, right? You, where you come with an idea and you can actually see it, you know, to fruition at the end of the day. Uh, of course, we can talk more about this, you know, in our Q&A later. Your second year is where you get to design what your MBA program would look like for you, right? Now, this is where you have an option of a lot of international exposure activities as well. Number one being, you know, con uh, your international modules, right? Now, this year, we have several international modules taking place in locations like New York, Sao Paulo, Mexico City, uh, one app happening in India, Hong Kong, and Nairobi. Now, each of these immersive weeks are more about getting, giving you an understanding and exposure of, say, for example, New York City would be all about capital markets, right, and finance. Um, say, you know, your Sao Paulo would be all about, you know, uh, leading businesses in a very dynamic or politically uh, sort of volatile environment, right? India is, of course, the next big growth, growth story that all of us want to hear about. If not, you can also opt for something called the International Exchange Program. I did this myself. I went to Johnson Cornell for an entire semester via the exchange program. And to me, this was a fantastic opportunity to expand my network, to uh, be in a completely different uh, sort of learning environment, right? ESA was all about case method. Cornell was a very, very different learning, you know, opportunity. And also getting the um, exposure to, you know, probably a, a pedigree of professors that I would not have had access to, right? So I think this is also a great opportunity that, you know, you can explore if you're interested in maximizing all of these international opportunities. If not, you can also continue living in Barcelona. It's, trust me, the best thing. And uh, choose from over 130, uh, you know, electives that will come your way. We do have, you know, certain concentrations defined, which if you want, you can also opt for. Again, these are not compulsory. But if you do decide to finish credits in a certain concentration, it will appear on your degree. For example, a concentration in international business or, you know, sustainability and responsible business, data analytics, if, if you know, this is a stream that you're interested in. And this is typically how your entire two-year period at ESA would look like. I know that you see something called the 15 months versus the 19 months program. Now, here my recommendation to you, especially an international candidate, would be to opt for the 19 month unless you are probably going back to your family business or you're a sponsored candidate, right? Which means that you already have a placement available for you. Because what happens in the 15 month is that you essentially give up your summer internship to complete your elective core courses, right? So unless and until you have your recruitment sorted out, I would always suggest that go for the 19 month program because the internship is usually a great way to, or a great segue into your full-time job opportunity as well, right? For example, you saw Anand, he did his internship in finance, but eventually probably realized that consulting was more his jam and event, you know, ended up going for a consulting full-time role post the MBA, right? So I think this, it's very, very crucial that you don't miss out on the internship opportunity as an international student. Quickly moving on to what the class profile is like. I know I get a lot of questions in terms of, so, you know, my GMAT is uh, X and Y or my GRE score is A or B, you know, like, will I get rejected or will I get accepted? Uh, let me tell you that all of these are dangerous and all of these don't mean that it's a filter, right? Just because you have like, you know, um, a 640 on your GMAT doesn't mean you're rejected. And similarly, if you have a 750, doesn't mean you're automatically taken to the next stage and level, right? Likewise, in terms of while we say our average work experience is five to six years, I know for India, you know, this tends to be a little bit lower. Our minimum requirement is three years. So unless and until you finish three years, you should definitely apply because at the end of the day, we want to see that even in these three to four years, how have you grown, right? So you remember something that Natasha was mentioning in her pyramid earlier that showcase your professional growth, any leadership opportunities that you've taken. And leadership often doesn't even mean that, oh, but I have zero reportees, Riddhi, you know, like how does that work? It can even mean in terms of leading a project, right? It can even mean in terms of leading a particular team for, you know, a very, very short period of time. Right? It just shows your ability to manage 
you know, time, manage stakeholders' responsibilities, and probably even like, you know, manage crisis from time to time, right? Um, number that I'm very, very proud to share is that this year we've had about 37% women in class, one of the highest uh, that ESA has ever seen. And, you know, the goal is to obviously keep increasing this number uh, year on year. And like I said, you know, we have more than 85% national international students uh, on campus and representing more than 50 nationalities uh, in class. The case method, right? Something that we all keep talking about at ESA, but what is this case method and how does it actually work? Uh, I do understand that a lot of us who come from a very, very typical Indian education system uh, are not very well versed with the case method. So how the case method actually works is that you would essentially have a 20 or 25 page case study. Let's assume it's probably about Netflix, right? And Netflix is worried about how do they increase, uh, you know, subscription base post, you know, pandemic when there was a, a, a dip, you know, in, in people actually watching OTT content, right? Now, while this could primarily be a marketing case study, but you would, of course, have to run your numbers, do your analytics, you know, understand, uh, you know, what's the, what's the uh, customer sentiment, understand, you know, what competitors are doing, you know, and I think most importantly, you're looking at this even from a leadership perspective, right? Is this a business development, uh, you know, next opportunity? If not, do we, you know, enter a new market? So there are so many aspects to just one case study. Now, how do you work with this is that you actually work on, you know, a particular case study by yourself, you meet with your learning team. Now, this learning team is typically assigned to you on day one at ESA, which usually comprises of like people from all different backgrounds, cultural, academic, professional. And post this discussion with your team, you take this to your section, which has about 70 odd peers in class and a professor who's leading this case discussion, right? And maybe I think this is something that we can uh, deep dive on further in the Q&A, Natasha, about like how the case study has really helped us in terms of our learning and growth. Moving on to the recruitment, which is, of course, one of the most important aspects in terms of, okay, where do Indian students get placed, right? Um, but what about Spain, you know? I mean, doesn't Spain require Spanish as, like, you know, the primary language? And I would say, yes, it does. So as an international or Indian student, in fact, you would be targeting multiple locations. I'm going to quickly move on to this slide first before I talk more about the previous one. So if you see, these are actually companies where Indian students or international students have gotten placed post-ESA. As you see, Spain is a very, very small part of it. You know, there's, of course, the UK uh, where, you, you know, you have your entire banking, your, uh, you know, tech and also, you know, your uh, uh, consulting companies, you know, recruiting. You have, you know, countries in Europe, right, whether it's Germany, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Belgium, Denmark, again, very, very open to recruiting native English speakers, right? You have Dubai, which is also becoming, you know, a, a very, very strong hub for ESA in terms of recruitment, uh, both in finance and consulting. Right. And then, of course, you have certain companies in Spain. In fact, this year we have, you know, a couple of students who are working with Spanish brands uh, with their headquarters in Spain without even like probably having like two lines of Spanish, uh, you know, that they know. Right. So, of course, the, the entire landscape is changing dramatically. But remember, guys, that when all of these companies come to campus for recruitment, they're open to recruiting for their global offices. And when I say global, it's primarily, you know, the EU, the UK and Dubai. Right. So you would be, in fact, targeting locations across all these three, uh, you know, uh, all of these three uh, locations and not just restricting yourself to Spain. And just coming back up to, you know, what are some of these tracks that you see right now as part of, say, the consulting club or the finance club, the tech club, and of course, you know, the career development center hosts these smaller events that take place. So, for example, the consulting track takes place in Dubai and London. Finance uh, track happens, you know, in London as well. Uh, there's a marketing track that happens, you know, in France um, and even in Berlin right now. And through these tracks, you actually get to meet all of these recruiters. You visit all of these different offices. You know, you get like the, let's say like the side door and the back door entry right to all of these different recruitment uh you know offices and uh you know recruitment teams right that you can have your fireside conversations network with them trust me when i think networking is going to get you at least 10 steps ahead of you know the rest of you know the, your peerage uh and and probably anand can like you know highlight this a little more when we come to him about how networking has been so essential uh you know in his growth as well right and especially when it comes to professional development 
As you can see that the three industries that ESA does very, very well in are consulting. A third of the class, you know, pretty much over the last, you know, four to five years has been consistently recruiting in consulting. Uh, financial services is next at about 20%. And then, of course, tech has been growing. You know, we saw a little bit of a dip uh, this year because obviously the global landscape didn't support technology focused, uh, you know, hiring. But overall, we have seen a consistent 15% upwards of recruitment in the tech sector as well. And the last part of my presentation is the application. Uh, we have done away with the early round this year. So your first deadline is round one, which is in September. The application is now live uh, on you know, our portal. So you can start going in and filling in you know, the application form. An interesting element is that we this year have a video essay uh, as part of the overall application. I'll talk about it in just a bit. Uh, and apart from that, the typical progression of the application requirement is you need to submit your written application followed by your video essay. You will then be shortlisted for a process interview along with the assessment day. I'll also touch upon what the assessment day is all about. And then, of course, you know, you have your final admission. Remember that scholarship is part of your application. If you want to apply for a scholarship, you must do it as part of your application form. We do not accept external scholarship uh, requests once your application is submitted. Now, the two things that uh, I'd like to elaborate a little bit more on, which is the assessment day and the video essay. I'll talk about the video essay first. Uh, this is a new feature, of course, that we've added. All this while, we had two essays as part of our application. One was a personal essay and one was, of course, a, a career-focused essay. So the career-focused essay is still, st still stays on the written application form. What we've done is we've taken away the personal essay in the written format and converted that into a video essay. While the question is not the same, it will be a randomized question that will come, you know, your way, but then they all are going to be behavioral focused questions, right? So it is purely about us wanting to get a more authentic understanding of who you are, uh, get an opportunity to meet with you, right? Before we actually, you know, uh, uh, meet with you formally during, you know, your process interview. And I think most importantly, also evaluate your communication style, right? So number one, don't get too stressed about it. It's not a very, very difficult step. It's just about, you know, going to be one of those behavioral questions that we want to understand, you know, uh, a personality trait of yours, right? Or probably we want to understand how well you worked with the team or, you know, uh, if you had any leadership story that you wanted to share, any impact story that you wanted to share with us, right? You are going to be given a minute to prepare and a minute and a half to submit your response. It's going to be a one-time thing, but there are a lot of practice sessions that are available to you so that you get more acclimatized. This is going to happen via the Kira platform. Remember that the video essay will only be triggered once you come finish and submit your written application. Remember that you, you, know, you want to do this a little bit prior in time because we will not accept a, an application without the video essay being completed by the deadline. When it comes to the assessment day, this is actually a really, really fun day. Uh, again, not very stressful for you because we're just trying to understand how well you would fit in with the overall, you know, ESA community, right? Whether it's, you know, like I said, strong collaboration, you know, uh, ability to work with the team, you know, and even your analytical thinking skills, right? So we really want to know that if we were to actually place you on campus today, how well would you, you know, uh, kind of gel with, you know, what ESA has to offer? So this is a chance for us to evaluate you in a very different setting. So think of it like a group discussion or like, you know, a group setting that you would find yourself in and how you behave with that group, which of course you've never met before, right? So this is what the assessment day is all about. And yeah, that's that's all about it. And this is of course Anand, who you already met. Uh, and, you know, Anand give you a brief uh, introduction to himself. So with this, uh, Natasha, I'm going to stop presenting. So that you know we can take the q a and then we can come back to these slides um, as and when required you're on mute yeah that's great Riti. um so i have a lot of questions actually so i've started writing them down while we were while we were speaking so um i'm going to focus on a couple of questions that i have around um you know first around the application process because there's there's been a lot to unpack in that and you know there are changes as well so, um, you know, what I'd like to do is just cover some basic questions, you know, uh, we spoke about, you know, I understand that fit and demonstrating fit is really important um, in a business school application. And, you know, you validated that with how you look at evaluating or positioning, you know, your candidature is, you know, fit is extremely important. But, you know, what I want to understand is if we were to break it down, what are the factors that you really consider when evaluating an applicant's fit uh, with ESA? 
like, you know, how important is like the standardized test score, you know, and the different elements of the application. So if you could just throw some light on that. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think I would, you know, just, just for ease of understanding, Natasha, I would probably break it down into three segments. Number one being the academic fit, right? So mm -hmm. the academic it is, of course, you know, your GP from your undergraduation, right? Um, the the college or the brand of college that you went to, you know, the kind of education, whether you were an engineer, whether you, you know, you have a business major or any other, you know, related uh, major. And then, of course, I'm looking at your standardized test course. You know, what is your GRE or your GMAT? How does it peg with peers from similar backgrounds that you come from, right? So this is where the comparison takes place. And because all of this is to understand how well would you be able to cope with the academic rigor? at DSA, right? Are you somebody who's going to be able to go? Because DSA is very, very academically rigorous. You know, I mean, Anand can probably chime in as to how how hard it hits you going back to school, uh, you know, when you're on campus. Uh, but uh, this is this is something that, you know, we really value strongly. Now, again, if you have a low GPA in college, right? Uh, how do you kind of rectify that? You can't, right? So I would say there are several steps you can take to overcome this. Number one is, are there any other, you know, credits courses that you've taken, which can highlight your analytical, your strong communication skills, right? Especially a low GPA from college needs to be combated with like a higher standardized test score, right? Again, we're very open to all formats of the GRE and the GMAT. Uh, we accept the focus edition, the original edition, the short version of the GRE, the normal version of the GRE. So that has no bearing in terms of, you know, we prefer one over the other, but it's all about balancing your profile and making sure that there are red flags from the academic fit. You're using other aspects, you know, to highlight that, okay, I do have, you know, the requisite skills. Now, the second one is a career fit, right? We want to understand that how have you grown, you know, from your career journey, from the time you started to where you are now. And most importantly, how does that align? with your future MBA goals, right? For example, like Anand said, he had, you know, strong investment banking, you know, uh, a background. Um, so probably for him, you know, an internship in finance made sense because he had all, you know, probably the basics and all the requisite knowledge and understanding of, you know, the finance of the banking sector while he did his internship. Now, what probably ESA supported him on was developing the consulting focus, right? Which helped him after two years, you know, pivot his career into a completely different field, which was consulting. But it's all about, what are those transferable skills right what how can you show that resume which is in my opinion one of the most important documents on your application that really shows this progression highlights your skill sets right every point on your resume should be almost like you know showing impact and always personal impact over a larger team impact right I worked with a team of 10 to create XYZ, but what did you do in that, right? So I would say, look at your resume very, very closely because that tells us what role you play in your team, in your organization, and what's the impact you've created and, and how well will that align with, say, your dream job, you know, post the MBA. And yeah. the last, is, of course, the cultural fit, right? Hmm. And this is where, of course, you know, things like the process interview, you know, the video essay, the assessment, they really highlight and tell us, you know, is this individual a good collaborator, right? Do, do I, and I think most importantly, you know, do I see this person in my team, right? Will I want this individual in my class or my section, you know, at DSA? Uh, what are they bringing to the table? Are they, are they humble, right? Are they adaptable? Are they also making sure that others on the team, you know, have a chance to talk, right? Are they somebody who is in, interested and invested in not only personal growth, but also helping others around them grow, because this is really the true culture at ESA. I think I have never encountered anyone at ESA uh, who refuses to support you and help you no matter what. Like I have seen peers who are sitting, uh, probably competing for the same role, sitting and doing mocks with each other, right? Like what do you say, Anand? What was your experience like when it comes to like culture at ESA? No, while you were answering, Riddhi, I was just thinking that uh, social rather cultural fit is probably equally or maybe more important than some of the other fits, simply because I think, like you mentioned, it's a highly, highly collaborative MBA. It's not one of those uh, my way or the highway kind of a thing. Right from day one, you're put into a team, the team becomes your family. Every case, like we already discussed, it's a case-based uh, system of education, right? So every day you're dealing with three cases. All of those three cases, you're working day in, day out with your team. All your career-related preparation is largely student-driven. So the second years take the lead, uh, become the uh, leaders of the clubs, and the clubs then guide you. So all your second years are fully invested in you uh, from day one, you know, helping you craft your CV, re reviewing your cover letters, sharing their 
internship experiences because now you're targeting for the same roles, giving you mocks, not, not just, uh, I would say second years, your batchmates, but even people who've graduated three, four, five, 10 years back, you know, if you reach out to them, if they are available, if you strike a chord with them, they're always very, very willing to, you know, share information, share the experiences, uh, help you understand what the company is, what the role is. So in general, I think there's a very strong collaborative uh, spirit within the ESA cohort, which stays during the MBA and right, like many, many years after the MBA. So that collaborative culture is super important. And second, of course, when you talk about the cultural fit, right? Seeing how you, like you may excel in your own environment, but how you would perform in a diverse environment because it's a very international class. When we talk about diversity, it's not just international and number of countries, but the kind of people you're interacting with, right? People come with very diverse opinions, very diverse experiences and mindset. And sometimes like for me, it was a little bit of a challenge initially because I came from a finance background and living and worked in India. And, you know, suddenly when we were looking at problems and somebody started talking about, you know, the people aspect of it, of the problem. For me, being a finance person, it was all about numbers. So, you know, your peers will challenge you and then how you interact and perform with that team and with that cohort is super important because, you know, you cannot be a very high headed person uh, because then you will not, that, that's maybe you meant for some other MBA. ESL is not the MBA for you. So I think it's very important. Absolutely. That is spot on. I think, I mean, we've, we've got a lot of great information here and, you know, thank you both of you. Uh, you know, there are two parts of the application process that I really want to, uh, you know, get your view on because, you know, those are, uh, you know, uh, parts of the application that can really throw an applicant because they're so unique to the school yeah. and, you know, they may not know how exactly to approach it. And the first of, of those components is the assessment day, because I think um, one of the things that I have seen, um, you know, applicants really struggle with is how do you prepare for the assessment day? They will read um, a lot of information about it. But at the end of the day, if they have to be armed with a particular perspective or a toolkit, you know, what would your top tips be for applicants to, you know, be prepared for or to just think about as they come to the assessment day? Yeah, absolutely. I think the number one tip, you know, Natasha, I would give uh, all candidates uh, as they prepare for the assessment day is to think about how to work with a diverse international team, right? Or forget international team, you know, a lot of us may not have had this exposure, this experience. I didn't have it, you know, before I did my own assessment day. It's simply to think about how do I work well as a teammate, right? Because this is really, really what we want to assess, you know, the assessment day is a lot about identifying that final piece of the puzzle, which is the culture fit, right? Because the process interview is one where we already get a lot of information from, you know, the candidate on the career and the academic part, right? But when we see them interacting with their peer network, right? How well are they able to step up when required, but also at the same time, take a back seat so that others in the room, get a chance to talk, right? Are they a natural leader when it comes to a team? Are they too overwhelming or are they too underwhelming, right? So I feel like it's really thinking about what's my personality type and how do I display that in a team without, of course, being aggressive, you know, a common challenge. And, and let me tell you this, you know, this is an insight which would probably be very helpful for your candidates, Natasha, is that as, you know, um, a nationality, probably, you know, we tend to be, individuals who want to always share our viewpoints, right? But I think what you have to be more cognizant of is that it's not always about getting your word in, right? It's really about using your team's experiences to share your own biases and really embracing what others have to say. It's okay if your analysis was not, you know, what the team agrees with. It's more about how you let go of your analysis and, and you were able to very quickly understand what probably your team members had to say and use your insights to add to that, right? I think that's what we want to see. You know, it's not about, at the end of the day, in the assessment, in Natasha, we're not thinking who brought the best answer to the table, right? Because this is all pre-MBA. This is what the MBA is going to equip you with, right? At the end of the MBA, we want to know that, yes, who got the right answer? You know, before the MBA is, is a lot about, even if you didn't bring the right answer, how open were you to embracing others' perspectives, right? And how respectful and humble were you about your team members, but at the same time, willing to participate and willing to sort of contribute. And I think most importantly, be a contributing member to your team. So yeah. I think this 
the, the assessment day is all about, you know. So I think anyone who's coming, whether if you're, you know, indulging in a case study or a presentation, definitely come prepared. You know, coming underprepared is really the worst thing you can do for yourself. But I think most importantly, focus on how do I want to present myself as a good team team member or a team. Okay, okay. Uh, and what about the uh, the video uh, essay? So here's a couple of questions I had around the video essay. Uh, so one is that, uh, you know, you mentioned that you can, uh, you know, you gain access to the platform to record your video essay after you submit the application. So um, there's the video essay, you know, the application submission plus the video essay need to be done by the deadline that you've provided. Absolutely. Both Absolutely. components, right? So, I, and remember, you will have 48 hours to complete the video essay. So, I would yeah. always suggest that, you know, don't wait till the absolute last day and the final hour to hit submit to your, you know, application because, you know, there could often be like a couple of hours lagged at the time, you know, you get your link for the video essay. You also want to give yourself sufficient time to be mentally, you know, in the zone to answer the video essay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's one opportunity you're getting to, you know, put your thoughts uh, forward to us, right? So, okay. Please put your best foot forward. So please prepare in advance, I would say for sure. How can, you know, you mentioned that the Kira platform also gives you opportunities to practice, you know, uh, but, um, you know, what are the ways in which you suggest that an applicant can get the maximum value or, you know, the maximum, uh, you know, benefit of those practice sessions? So are there any tips that you'd like to give someone so that they can check their progress before they actually record their answers? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the practice session is a great way to also get comfortable with the camera, right? Uh, and to get comfortable answering a question, because sometimes I feel, you know, we get rattled when it comes to just, you know, talking to a screen versus, you know, when you're having a conversation with an individual. So I think the number one, I would say is that when you're doing these practice sessions, try to try to relax as much as you can because you know if you get stressed and, and if you start fumbling that's the one shot you're going to have to answer your question right so i would say use the practice session to get more and more familiar with you know constructing a structure to your answer right use the practice time to you know really think about okay what are the three or four points that I want to talk about remember you have only 90 seconds to answer so you can't potentially talk about you know like three four five experiences right you should probably ideally stick to one experience and explain that in a very sort of strong structure whether and you know something that we always see right like the, the star format right what was you know the situation right what was the task at hand what was the action that you took and most importantly what was the result and learning from it right so I feel like if you if you follow this star learning format I don't think there's any question on the Kira platform that you know we have for you that you won't be able to answer well yeah I think that's great advice and you know it it, it will help an applicant evaluate their progress far more holistically uh, because I you're right you know I think a lot of people fumble when they see themselves on camera the first time so and for many people that is the first time they're going to see themselves on camera so that's great um, I also, you spoke extensively about, uh, you know, scholarships, but what I want to understand is, you know, what is the primary, um, you know, what are the primary decision making, uh, you know, uh, parameters when you're looking at scholarships and dispersing uh -huh. those? Of course, I think scholarships typically are a lot in Natasha on a need plus merit basis, right? We don't look at one or one over the two in isolation. It's always a combination of the two. Uh, so I would say very structurally answer your scholarship essay when we ask you, you know, how do you plan to fund your MBA? Right? Give us a very clear understanding of, okay, this is, you know, I'm probably using 30% of my savings or like, you know, 30% of the MBA is probably funded by my savings. The rest I need to take a loan. Uh, my scholarship expectation is X, Y, and Z, right? And when we are writing your scholarship essay, more often than not talk about we already know what your achievements are by your resume, right? To use your insights of ESA to tell us how are you going to leverage your experiences to pay it forward to ESA, right? Because if think about it, if ESA as an institution is supporting you, you want to know how will you use your, so whether, you know, you're a chartered accountant, right? How will you use your chartered accountancy skill set to probably help, you know, peers on campus who have like, you know, zero to low background in finance and accounts, for example, right? Something with the finance club. So this is where your school research plays, uh, you know, has, has a strong sort of role to play. Uh, and when I'm looking at an overall profile, I have to say that, you know, the scholarship is where the GRE and the GMAT score matters more than the admit decision. 
right? Because that's where the merit aspect comes in. So typically, you know, if you are as I would say as an Indian, you know, applicant, uh, a 700 plus in your, you know, GMAT will definitely, you know, play in your favor if you're applying for scholarship. Uh, and number two, any kind of leadership activities that we get to learn about, you know, from your application. And I think even most importantly, any community development, right, that you've done. Now, we're, it's also easy for us to identify if you start doing community work three months before actually applying to ESA versus, you know, if you were really invested in, you know, that cause or, uh, you know, that particular uh, association for a longer period of time, you know. So, so I think be authentic, but also the more you show us in terms of how you're able to actually contribute to, you know, team society beyond just, you know, your designated work, um, the more likely we are to want to support you in terms of financial aid. Okay. If I could great just advice. step in yeah. here, really probably a question more than a, a comment. Uh, so the scholarship essay does not have a bearing on the result of the candidate, right? In case uh, if there is no scholarship, that does not mean that because of that, the student would be rejected. Absolutely. Uh, is that right? Absolutely. Thank you so much for pointing that, Anand. Yes. Um, I think the decision is agnostic to your scholarship. Yeah, exactly. You know, so don't worry that, oh, I'm just because I'm applying for scholarship, you know, um, I might not get an admit, you know, don't do that because this is literally your one and only chance to apply for scholarship. Once you have an admit and if you reach out to us saying, oh, but you know, Riddhi, I, I, I really need the scholarship, it's going to be impossible to consider your case, right? So, uh, yes, the two don't work hand in hand. Your admit decision happens first and after that your scholarship decision happens, you know, so, so thanks a lot Anand for pointing it out. Great. So my next question is actually for Anand, because I'm going to come back to the discussion that, you know, Riti had around the case study method. Um, and, you know, as someone who um, has also, you know, been a part of this, uh, you know, Anand, I really want to understand, um, you know, the, just being exposed to the case study methodology, um, you know, how has it had, a, you know, a bearing on your post MBA experience? You know, how have those learnings really, uh, you know, shown up in your post MBA experience? Right. So I think uh, how it helps is because of the number of cases that you do at ESA is quite a bit. I think over the span of 18, 19 months, I don't remember the exact number, but somewhere it's to the tune of 400, 500 cases, right? Okay. So over time, you, let's say, develop a framework and a structure of attacking a problem. And that structure is firstly not sacrosanct to like one kind of structure. And second, is not relevant only to one kind of problem. So I would say the first and foremost thing that you develop is just structurally attacking any problem because you know, it, you're know you not doing it once, you're not doing it twice. You're doing it on an iterative basis over two years uh, across 500 diverse problems. So maybe the number 500 is a little off, but yeah, more or less somewhere to that tune. So I think that uh, framework always stays with you because essentially when you join any work, it could be, you know, a startup, a consulting, an entrepreneurial uh, venture or anything, you will deal, you will come up with completely new problems, which you haven't dealt with. And you, you know, you haven't studied in a book because books do not cover hundred percent of what's going to come in the life. Right. So I think that framework really helps you because it allows you to have that toolkit with you. That's the first and foremost thing that I would uh, uh, highlight as helped me or, you know, continues to help me. Second is, you know, going back to the, let's say, diversity part of it. So you, a lot of times, because, you know, this is an MBA, people come with, you know, five, six, 10 years of experience. I've already worked a fair bit and have, let's say, a preconceived notion of looking at things because of, you know, they've done a certain kind of job. Uh, and what happens is you're in first instant gut feeling is to, you know, take the same approach, but because you're in a class of 50, 60 people who are completely diverse, you know, of course, there, there might be five, six bankers, five, six consultants, but you know, the re then rest 80% is completely different. So I think what a case method also allows you because it's a free flowing conversation, you start to appreciate, oh yeah, I didn't think about this point. Yes, probably this could also be a solution. So, you know, your solution is not the only solution or is not the best solution. And uh, so it allows you to think uh, differently and consider certain aspects that you may not naturally do. Uh, 
third i think in general i think it makes classes more interesting because a lot of these brands that you're discussing you've heard of let's say you've heard of some of these problems at a surface level but never really and try to dig deep into you know why uh, Coke and Pepsi are the two companies. Why Adidas and Nike are so closely competing? And these are cases that we discuss. You know, what? Why did Uber had issues with? You know, whatever. So these are problems that we discuss. And it's just you're there not only for a job. You're there to you know feel enlightened and feel challenged and feel you know excited. So I think those cases help you do that. And finally, I would just uh, probably say that a lot of times you know the cases, the companies, the problems that you're discussing, it just happens that. You know, the classmate of yours actually was one of the team members who was dealing with that problems. And I can think of two, three instances where I clearly remember. So once we were discussing a Tiffany case and the person who was uh, probably involved uh, in the team who was looking at that was sitting in our class. So she had such a great level of insight to share that was, we could have never gained access to. Similarly, we were discussing, I think, A6 once, and there was a person who who who... who uh, who was part of that team who was looking at that. And uh, yeah, so I think it, it's not only good for your, uh, you know, learning, but it also make, makes it fun and interesting. And just to add to that, Natasha, I think what, why the case method is something that ESA uh, still continues to pursue year on year is also, it helps us stay agile, you know, with the changing trends, you know, um, for example, uh, when I was in B school from 15 to 17, probably we had 20% of cases that had the whole sustainability anchor. Right. We saw, you know, 2017 to almost 2020, there was such a huge uh, uprise in terms of sustainability and, and you know, case studies were eventually tweaked, uh, you know, replaced with, uh, you know, a stronger focus in sustainability, which obviously lent itself to us launching a sustainability concentration. The last one and a half years, uh, you know, when I was talking to some current students and they talked about AI, right, a topic that none of us can walk away from and, and how, uh, you know, a significant number of case studies that they do in class actually have, you know, the whole AI concept, right, how AI is actually changing business, transforming business, you know, something that we never had probably six years ago in B school is something that's already incorporated. So I think this is where not having that, you know, situational that that structured textbook where it's difficult to move away from, you know, the concepts and the curricula. Uh, the case study method really allows ESA to kind of be very on topic and current with, you know, the overall geographical, economical landscape at large. That's great. Insight. And just, just maybe one last uh, yeah, anecdote please. to share here. A lot of the cases, uh, the people who wrote that or the CFO or the CEO who was actually in the middle of that situation are invited as guests to these classes, right? So that's just different level of insight they can share, which sometimes, you know, Authors don't want to pen it down because yeah. it goes on record, but they come and speak to you in person and tell, you know, how they were dealing and coping with that situation at that point. And I think gaining their perspective is invaluable, right? When you yes. understand what goes into that level of decision making and those particular situations where there's no right or wrong answer. So, you know, that's just great insight. Um, you know, I had a question around uh, your language. Now, Riddhi, you mentioned about language requirements, but, you know, you also gave us great insight into, uh, you know, how students can look at opportunities, not just that, you know, in Spain, but, you know, there, there are so many opportunities that, um, you know, you help students with worldwide. And, you know, there are so many avenues for them to really access those opportunities through the school. Um, you know, I actually also wanted to pivot and ask about, you know, living in Barcelona, is language going to be a constraint for an international student? Are they required to have, you know, a minimum level of proficiency in Spanish um, in order to just, you know, navigate the city and navigate their daily life? Uh, I think I can safely say that I knew two lines of Spanish, which is hola, uh, mi nombre uh, no hablo español. And I was like, my name is Riddhi and I don't speak Spanish. Uh, I don't know how much Spanish Anant knows, but uh, but I think we we thrived, you know, not only survived in uh, Spain uh, and, and I think more so Barcelona. And I think, uh, of course, you know, ESE offers you, you know, a Spanish course that you can take, you know, while you're on campus through the two years uh, and go from like, you know, zero to at literally business level Spanish. I had like a lot of very enthusiastic peers who actually did that. 
I think I took it for two months and I said, okay, this is enough for me. This is all the Spanish I need to know. What is vegetarian? What is non-vegetarian? What is, uh, you know, like what is left, right? Uh, and what is stop and pause? And I think I was I was done with my Spanish. And uh, it's very, very easy and comfortable to live in Barcelona uh, with, you know, even I would say the most basic or no understanding of Spanish at all because it's not a location that, uh, you know, also it's very very culturally embracive you know as a city uh you know it, they're not I don't think uh, any of us ever faced any kind of racism which is something important for you know international students to know because there are you know different parts of Europe uh you know where there, there's high amount of racism but I think Barcelona is one city which is quite the reverse in its sense you know like if you're stuck somewhere on the street and you know you you need help there are going to be four people wanting to like you know help you put on put you on the right bus or put you in the right cab tell the cab driver where you know you need to go uh so I think and I think most importantly even as a female applicant right or a female student uh you know I think another than I would have different perspectives here because it's important um that a lot of these thoughts crossed my mind and probably you know may not have even crossed Anand's mind right like is it safe for me to you know come home from like a social event you know at midnight or past midnight you know uh, what's access to the public transport you know in in Barcelona how safe is it to you know walk alone uh you know in the middle of the day or you know a little later in the night and I can say that all of these things are uh something that I was never worried about while living in Barcelona myself and I think it lends a lot to your overall experience, you know, of being uh, uh, at ESA because if I think it's not just about, you know, the academics and then the career, right? It's it's two years of your life that you're really having this immersive experience where you learn a lot about yourself as an individual. What about you, Anand? How much Spanish do you know? <laughs> uh, maybe one line more than what you ah, know. You but, <laughs> No, so I think, uh, of course, it is Spain. It's a Spanish-speaking country. So, you know, outside of the campus, it does help if you speak Spanish. Like Riddhi mentioned, uh, ESA offers a uh, Spanish course all across the two years. And I have Indian friends who did not speak a word of Spanish but end up being fluent. So if, you, if you're if you interested, dedicated towards it, sure, it can be learned. But, you know, in, gen in general, you know, let's say your experience on the campus or in the city, I don't think it's constrained in any manner. Uh, like both of us did not speak any Spanish. Uh, firstly, you have to see that, you know, like MBA is a bubble. So you're always surrounded by, and ESA is a big community there. So you're always surrounded by 600 people who speaks English at least, you know, and then in general, Barcelona as a city has been becoming more and more international because of the startup ecosystem that's been developing there so a lot more uh, international people there now versus what probably five years six years back was so i think no spanish is not a compulsion uh is a good to have if you have it for sure you know it, it's easier to move around within the local city but uh, you can very well do your mba successfully without speaking a word of it okay and anand you know i have uh, another question for you in this line actually uh you know you mentioned about you know what it means to be an Indian student and navigating the campus but um, I also understand that you were um, you know president of the India Business Club um, and I just want to understand you know how that Indian community um, really supports like the next generation of the incoming uh, Indian students on campus. Yeah so uh, the India Business Club uh, is let's say the club that drives all of these support activities for the incoming batch. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot that the club does. So, for example, we start with a early onboarding and mentorship program. Uh, so, where you know where the club uh, tries to assign one-on-one -on -one mentors based on, let's say, your personal and professional goals. Uh, these this starts as early as probably June, July. So, people are helping you from every right from everything. You know how to get your visas, which apartment to, where to find apartments, what the right rates. Uh, what can you prepare during the summer if you're looking for some career advice, who to talk to, connecting you to, you know, different people within the second years, connecting you to alums. Uh, so, yeah, like there is a very good comprehensive, uh, let's say, mentorship and onboarding program that the club uh, students host for you. And, uh, you know, people have been, that was the reason I had a smooth, uh, very smooth transition uh, from India to Barcelona. And you have to keep in mind that I did, I moved in September, 2020. So, you know, the world was under lockdown despite every, all of those COVID challenges. I, none of uh, my batchmates had any issues. So, you know, uh, 
really thankful to the club and i think uh, it continues that way that's on you know before coming to campus after coming to campus you know the, the india business club is again fairly active uh, very very uh, active in terms of social events uh, so you know india club hosts a lot of that's a big party so diwali is a very big event that we host we I have a close association with uh, the embassy so you know if there are any challenges once you are in spain uh, we have contacts with the embassy who help uh, uh, there are you know uh, informal catch ups that the club students do between second year and first year very frequently there's something there's a event called multiculti so you know india indian communities uh, center of attraction even there so i think uh, you your mentors of course which were assigned to you uh, during the first year of summer stay with you all through the uh, duration of your mba if you have any challenges uh, but yeah like the club does a fair bit uh, in terms of both professional and personal guidance absolutely uh, so i think yeah 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 and i think you know um, natasha like the the beauty of the india business club is that you know it's it's overwhelming when you move you know, to uh, a new city uh, you know when you are especially a b school right where everyone's really really bringing their a game to the table every day you know you're acclimatizing to so many different aspects of you know the esc mba program and this just feels like home right like it's just a feeling of uh, you know it's a safe space for you to you know share some of the challenges that you're facing because all of these are second year students who've gone through the same you know emotions that you like you know that you're going through now right so i think this forms is really good platform or a channel for any new student you know walking into esa knowing that okay even the most basic thing right like where do i find vegetarian food you know in barcelona right i mean that it's it may seem trivial but you know in that day to day struggle of like you know doing your three cases and you know starting you know your career on boarding uh, and at the same time you know figuring out okay is there something that i can do which will just ease out my living experience right and then i think even most importantly understanding what are actually all of the resources that esa has right you know sometimes you know we, you you will just get exposed to like 100 different things on you know on the first 10 days you know that you're at esa but having that mentor you know who probably shares the similar emotions that you did a as an international student b of course you know uh, as an indian uh, the, the the relatability is a lot better right okay you know i think you can go to this you know individual in the career development center you know they will help you you know perfecting your resume okay i think you should join the consulting club because this is what the consulting club will have to offer you so it's not just about the india business club but it's about like you know sharing their own experiences and helping the next generation really take that you know step forward Uh, also i would like to add something probably i think i missed uh, highlighting that so apart from you know all the personal uh, guidance that the club does at least for the last couple of years we've been doing a professional onboarding as well so there is a career cell that is driving everything so they are introducing you to the different opportunities on top of that the india business club for the last couple of years has been hosting uh, you know oh, let's say talks and sessions where they bring people focused on every different you know let's say industry and stream because while you're enrolling at the mbl a lot of us have clarity of what we want to do a lot of us are also in that exploratory phase right so the yeah sorry uh, are you saying something please oh, okay I, I, okay no i was just saying so a lot of us are in that exploration phase right so the club actually provides you that safe space where they do industry specific and you know career specific sessions uh, in in a smaller india uh, setting because it's an india business club event uh, where you can ask slightly more personal and nuanced question to people who've done it before and you know have a head start into your career journey before you even set foot on the campus that's that's really helpful uh, but anand you know i have a follow up question from this you know one of the primary reasons um or the primary benefit of you know being uh, of of being on a, on a campus and having this set of peers is also the connects that you form um, and which you know endure as an alum so so uh, my question to you would be that you know as a part of this community like if you if you were to give practical advice on how someone can you know leverage that alumni network 
um, you know, what is it that, you know, for professional growth, for personal growth, you know, can you give us some insights into your experience and what is it that you would tell someone considering, um, you know, Okay, I think, uh, Natasha, I was losing you in between, but I think I got the gist of the question. So cool. if I'm deviating, feel free to, you know, chime in between and I can change uh, <laughs> midway. But I think the question was focused on, uh, let's say, the alum network and uh, how one can leverage it, how I've been using it. I think uh, before I start sharing something worth, you know, going back to which I mentioned some, some time back is I think ESA is a very, very collaborative and uh, tight-knit community. So, you know, it doesn't matter uh, which year you are, the community always sticks out for you. So if I have to talk a little bit, let's say, from my personal experience, uh, I can probably start with while I was at the MBA. Uh, I was in that exploration phase where, you know, I was confused between finance and then consulting, then also some other ideas. And to clarify all that, uh, you know, I was constantly reaching out to people who have graduated three years, five years, 10 years back, I remember I'd asked Riddhi also to connect me to one of her batchmates and people are very, very happy to do that. So, you know, alum community is there. You just need to reach out to right people and people will always make time. It doesn't matter how busy they are. Uh, uh, so much so that, you know, not only video calls, people meet for uh, in-person coffees, lunches, drinks, etc. Purely with the intention of helping you solve your problems not to get get anything out of it so that was uh during the mba uh, uh after the mba if i think i'm already one year out right so i'm you know firstly esa is very international so you are, you can be rest assured that you will have a esa community almost all parts of the world right so i'm i don't speak i don't speak german i'm in i'm living in germany right so it's anyways uh, a little bit of a challenge and not so many indians here not so many of my friends who graduated because friend circle has now gone all over the world right so this alum body was my first let's say point of uh comfort so in munich there is an esa campus we have uh we've already had three on-campus events uh so where you get a chance to meet people you know as high as the ceo of my company was there for the last uh event right so the ceo of alliance was there and i had a chance to uh, interact with him over a drink at the campus because of that uh anything any problem that you have you can always reach out to people people will it doesn't matter whether it's a personal issue professional issue uh then in addition to that i think we have a very good uh, let's say alum portal uh so you have the option of lifelong learning so the school supports a lot of let's say ongoing uh upskilling initiatives uh which if you're part of the alum body you get benefit of uh, you have the ability to choose a mentor based on your liking could be anywhere in the world. And this, because it's through ESA, you can, you know, tap into some really, really senior people, you know, global leaders of some top companies, which it's impossible to even, you know, reach out to within your own company, right? It's purely because of the school that you're able to do that. Uh, and finally, I think uh, on a social level, uh, because it's so global, you know, there are always uh, reunions happening, there are trips happening, there are, uh, you know, catch-ups happening. So I think uh, it keeps your life also very fun, vibrant, especially when you're living away from home in a different part of the world. So I think uh, professionally and personally, both during the camp, during the MBA and post the MBA, uh, the alum body sticks out for you. Riddhi, you are also an alumni if you would like to add something. Yeah, absolutely. I think all of this, uh, and, and you know, let me kind of chime in from a different perspective, right? Like today as the admissions uh, director, I mean, I think Anand, you being here at uh, 8 a.m., uh, you know, your time is, is uh, you know, truth enough of how much, you know, the ESA alumni are invested in the next generation, right? And actually supporting, I mean, uh, Anand being here today, uh, there's, there's nothing he's gaining out of it, but simply just sharing his own, uh, you know, experiences. And I think this is what the ESA alumni chapter is really all about, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, a virtual event, or an in-person dinner uh, or like you know just a, a connect that you know I need to I need from an alumni for one of my you know potential candidates I don't think I've ever received like a no or can I do it later it's always like yes let me do it let's set it up maybe this week is a little tough can I do it like first thing next week right it's always always a positive response and I think I always like to say that we have a 80 to 90 percent hit rate right like if you reach out to like 10 
I guarantee you that eight or nine out of 10, you know, ESA alumni are going to support you with some help. I mean, even if they are not the right people, they'll kind of connect you with, okay, you know what? I don't think I'm the right person for it, but yo, let me connect you with X and Y, you know, they'll be better placed to help you with, you know, your questions, queries, and uh, you know what you need to know about the program. So I think it uh, you, you covered pretty much most of it. And even from my uh, experience now as the admissions, uh, you know, director, I do feel that I can always tap into this amazing network across the years to get support. Great. So, you Even, know what, uh, Anand, I'm going to like, yeah, tell me. Yes. No, I was just saying, uh, because how big the community is, even at Allianz, you know, we have a ESA community. So we have a different WhatsApp group. We have a different Teams group within Allianz because Allianz is a big company, right? So we do uh, bi-monthly, you know, catch-ups. People, and that's very comforting because, you know, when you're in a new company, in a giant company, uh, sometimes you can have challenges which you don't want to discuss probably with your team, with your manager, right? And you need some guidance and that guidance is always available. So it doesn't matter where you are, you will find someone to uh, reach out to. Certainly. Thanks. Um, so, you know, uh, Anand, I'm going to direct my last question to you. Um, if you had to give me like three words to describe, um, you know, the culture at ESA, what would those three words be? And, um, you know, is there any reason why you would prioritize those three words? That's a tough one because a lot of words come to my mind. <laughs> but probably the three words that I would choose and maybe I can share why I, I choose these is number one, uh, you know, global. Second is enriching. And third is probably inspiring. Uh, so global because, you know, we've already spoken about how international the community is. The school itself is, you know, I think we have eight, nine campuses already, maybe growing. Uh, so it's truly global in terms of not just its alum base, its uh, mindset, its approach, but it continues to increase. Uh, inspiring because, uh, you know, the people that come to ESA come after a very, let's say, rigorous process. So they're typically... Uh, top performers in whatever field, whatever wherever they're coming from. And uh, people constantly, you know, challenge you and inspire you to, let's say, push yourself, even though you've already achieved a fair bit of success in your career and your life, which is why you're on the campus. But when you reach there, you realize that, you know, oh my God, where am I? So, and it's a positive inspiration. It's not like a, a negative thing. So I think when you're surrounded by smarter and more driven people, you end up pushing yourself. And that's the whole point of, you know, studying at this age and doing another master's or whatever. So very, very inspiring. And third, I forgot what I said. Enriching. Sorry? I don't hear you, Riddhi. En enriching? Enriching, uh, uh, enriching because I think I would say, uh, in terms of the academic uh, curriculum that we discussed, right? It's a very, personally, I think I, all the students who are watching this should know ESA is a very rigorous MBA. So it pushes you uh, to the limit. And uh, while you complain uh, about it when you're during uh, in the campus, but I think it, over time you end up uh, learning so much because you're, you know, you're investing two years of significant amount of money into this MBA. So the MBA definitely enriches you both academically and outside of class, uh, again, the people aspect of it, uh, you have such brilliant conversations, uh, which force you to think very differently and come out as a completely different person. And more often than not, it's a better person than you know what you had entered. So I would say enriching. Yeah, that's a great insight. I think um, you know just thinking of business school and uh, you know your time on ESA as just a transformational experience. I think is a great way and a great high. Uh, for us to close this conversation on. So thank you very much, Anand. Um, I'd like to thank the both of you for giving us this time. I know we've extended beyond the time we had, but um, you know, I think it's just been a really great conversation. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm just very glad of the kind of insights we've got. Um, I think anyone who's watching this and is planning to apply to the school um, definitely has a lot of concrete um, information. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure if they do want to reach out to you, you all are on LinkedIn. And if anyone wants to continue that conversation, um, I think that you're, you, both of you are more than open to, you know, connecting with and just giving guidance to someone who's, uh, you know, thinking of the school. So, um, you know, uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, with that, 
Uh, yeah. Everything is on mute. And uh, you know, I mean, to to all of you at the Red Pen, because uh, I truly really believe that you know the right kind of guidance, mentorship that I'm sure that you know Red Pen provides uh, uh, is actually super critical in you know identify for students and identifying you know which is actually the right program for them. And like you said, very much available to have a conversation, uh, you know, deep dive into you know particular profile uh, of any of your candidates who are looking to you know get their MBA from ESA. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, thank you. And with that, uh, same here, Anand. Uh, I think I've had a great time. So uh, with that, I will close today's conversation. And uh, once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks.